after these memorable expressions, the present is the best opportunity of returning to a historical point, which I have long since promised to treat upon, and which ought to have found a place long before this. I allude to the conspiracy of George and Pichigrew and the trial of the Duke Dungian. I shall presently state the true reasons of this transposition and of the long delay that has occurred. For, said the emperor, had some time since recommenced with England when suddenly our coasts, our high roads, and the capital were inundated with agents from the Bourbons. A great number of them were arrested, but their plans could not yet be discovered. They were of all ranks and descriptions. All the passions were roused. The agitation of the public became extreme. A storm was gathering. The crisis assumed the most alarming aspect. The agents of the police had exhausted all their means without being able to obtain any information. My own sagacity saved me, observed Napoleon, having risen on one occasion in the night to work, as I frequently used to do, chance with which governs the world, directed my ideas to one of the last reports of the police, containing the names of those persons who had already been arrested in consequence of this affair, to which no clue had yet been obtained. Among those names, I observed that of a surgeon in the army. I immediately concluded that such a man must be an intriguer rather, <laughs> rather than a devoted fan fanatic, and I ordered every measure to likely be exhorted and a prop confession to be instantly resorted to against him. The affair was immediately placed in the hands of a military commission. In the morning, he was sentenced and threatened with immediate execution if he did not speak. Half an hour afterwards, he had disclosed everything, even to the most minute details. The nature and the extent of the plot which had been got up in London was then known in the intrigues of Moreau and the presence of Pichigrew in Paris. They were discovered soon after. I omit all the details of that affair. They may be seen in the letters written from the Cape in refutation of those of Dr. Warden and in the work of Mr. O'Meara. The particulars which I should relate would be precisely the same as those contained in the work last mentioned. They are derived from the same source. With respect to the accusation relative to the death of Pichigrew, who was said to have been strangled by order of the First Consul, Napoleon said it was too absurd and that it would be degrading to attempt to repel it. What advantage, he observed, could accrue to me from this death? A man of my stamp does not act without some powerful motive. Have I ever been known to shed blood through caprice, notwithstanding all the efforts that have been made to blacken my reputation and misrepresent my character? Those who know me know that crime is far into my nature. There is not a private act that has occurred during the whole course of my administration, of which I might not speak openly before a tribunal, not only without any disadvantage, but even with some credit to myself, the fact is that Pichigrew found himself placed in a hopeless situation. His high mind could not bear to contemplate the infamy of a public execution. He despaired of my clemency or disdained to appeal to it and put an end to his existence. Had I been disposed to crime, continued the emperor, it is not against Pichigrew who could do no harm, that I should have leveled the blow. But at Moreau, who had at that moment placed me in a most perilous situation, if the latter had unfortunately also killed himself while in prison, my justification would have been rendered much more difficult on account of the great advantage it would have been to me to get rid of him. You gentlemen who were abroad and the ultra-royalists who were in France have never known the true state of public opinion in France. Peace to grew having been once unmasked and exposed as a traitor to the nation no longer excited sympathy from any breast. And this feeling went so far that the circumstances of his being connected with Moreau was sufficient to affect the root of the latter who saw himself abandoned by many adherents, for in the struggle of parties, the majority of the people cared more about the commonwealth than about individuals. I judged so correctly in this business that when Rial came to propose to me the arrest of Moreau, I rejected the proposal without hesitation. Moreau is a man of too much importance, said I to him. 
He is too directly opposed to me. I have too great an interest in getting rid of him to expose myself thus to the conjectures of public opinion. But, replied Rial, if Moreau conspires with Pichigro, the case is then different. Prove that to me. Show me that Pichigro is in Paris, and I will instantly sign the order for the apprehension of Moreau. Rial had received indirect information of Pichigro's arrival, but had not yet been able to trace his steps. Run to his brother, said I. If he has left his residence, it will be a strong indication that Pichigro is in Paris. If he is still in his lodgings, arrest him. His surprise will soon inform you of the truth. This brother had been a monk and lived in a fourth floor in Paris. As soon as he found himself arrested, he asked before any question was put to him what fault he had committed and whether it was imputed to him as a crime that he had received against his will a visit from his brother. He had been the first, he said, to represent to him the peril of the situation and to advise him to go away again. This was quite enough. Moreau's arrest was ordered and carried into effect. Moreau appeared at first to be under no apprehension. But when he found, after he had been conducted into prison, that he was arrested for having conspired together with Pichigo and George against the state, he was quite disconcerted and extremely agitated. As to the greater number of those who composed that party, added Napoleon, the name of Pichigo seemed to them a triumph. They exclaimed on all sides that Pichigo was in London and that in a few days, Days, this would be proved for they either did not know that he was in Paris or believed that it would be easy for him to escape thence. The first consul had long since broken off with Moreau, who was entirely governed by his wife. This, said the emperor, is always a great misfortune because a man in that case is neither himself nor his wife is nothing. Moreau showed himself sometimes favorable to the first consul and sometimes against him, sometimes obsequious and sometimes sarcastic. The first consul who had wished to conciliate the affection of Moreau found himself under the necessity of giving him up altogether. Moreau, he had said, will in the end commit himself most seriously. He will someday break his head against the columns of the palace. And to this he was but too much instigated by the inconsiderate conduct and the ridiculous pretensions of his wife and his mother-in-law. The latter went so far as to contend for precedence with the wife of the first consul. The minister for foreign affairs, said Napoleon, had been obliged once on the occasion of a fete given by the ministers to use violence to oblige her to desist. After Moreau had been arrested, the first consul sent him word that it would be enough for him to confess that he had seen Pichigru in order to put a stop to all proceedings against him. Moreau answered by a letter in which he assumed a high tone. But afterwards, when Pichigru himself was arrested and the affair began to assume a serious aspect, Moreau wrote to the first consul a very submissive letter, but it was too late. It was perfectly true that Moreau had conferred with Pichigru and George and had given the following answers to their proposals. In the present state of affairs, I could not do anything for you. I could not even depend upon my own aides de camp, but get rid of the first consul. I have a party in the Senate and shall be me immediately appointed in his stead. You, Pichigru, will be examined upon the charge which is brought against you of having betrayed the national cause. Depend upon it. It is necessary that you should be put upon your trial, but I will be answerable for the result. From that moment, you will be second consul, and we will afterwards choose a third according to our wish and proceed altogether in concert and without interruption. George, who was present and whom Moreau had never known before, very urgently claimed that third place for himself. That cannot be, said Moreau. You have no knowledge of the state of public opinion in France. You have always been a wife. And you see that Pichigru will be obliged to wash off the stain of having had the intention of becoming one. I understand you, said George, highly and says, What farce are we playing here? And whom do you take me for? You are then working for yourselves alone and not all for the king? If that is the case, and if there must be a Baloo at the head of the government, I prefer the one who is there now. Upon this, they separated in dudgeon, and Moreau requested Pichigru not to bring that brute, that bull, devoid of sense and of all information anymore. On the trial, said Napoleon, the firmness of the accomplices. 
magnanimity by which they dignified their cause and the line of absolute denial recommended by this council saved Moreau on being questioned whether the charges brought against him of having held conferences and had interviews were true. He answered no. But the victor of Hohenlinden was unaccustomed to falsehood. A sudden flush diffused from each feature of his countenance, and none of the bystanders were deceived. However, he was acquitted, and most of the accomplices were condemned to death. I pardon several of them, all those whose wives succeeded in penetrating into my presence, or in whose favor strong intercessions were made, obtained their lives. The Polignacs... Mr. de Riviere and others would indubitably have perished, but for the intervention of some fortunate circumstances. Others less known, such as a man named Burrell, Ingon de Saint-Maur de Rochelle, etc., were equally fortunate. It is true, added he, that they did not afterwards show themselves very grateful for such a favor, and that if they were worthy to have their conduct investigated, it would be found that their actions have not been of a nature. To encourage clemency, one of them, who had on the occasion above mentioned, owed his life chiefly to the solicitations of Murat, is precisely the same man who set a price in Murat's head in Provence in the year of 1805. If he thought that fidelity should outweigh gratitude, the sacrifice must at least have been most painful to him. In others, the man who has most contributed to circulate the imputation as ridiculous as that concerning P. Sugar was absurd of the murder of the English lieutenant. Right. In the midst of the affairs of George P. Sugar and Moreau and the emperor, that of the Duke Duncan, happened and rendered the whole a strange complication, and he then related that affair in detail. This latter circumstance is the reason that induced me at the time to this place and postpone to this day the totality of the article, which I now give, for I felt a very great repugnance to touch upon a subject so painful in itself and so afflicting to several of my acquaintances who had been in direct relation with the prince or personally attached to him. Above all, I dreaded to awaken the legitimate grief of a high personage who has formerly honored me with some kind marks of kindness of which I have ever treasured the recollection. These are my motives. They will be understood and appreciated. But however, I am now approaching to the end of my work. And my duty as a faithful historian imperiously commands that I should take up this melancholy subject, lest my absolute silence should be misinterpreted. Nevertheless, I shall, for reasons before stated, omit all the details which are already known and which may have been read in the works already quoted. Letters from the Cape on Mr. O'Meara's work. My account would be the same, for all of them were heard from Napoleon's own mouth. I shall only relate a few particulars which have not found their way into the books above mentioned, and only such as appear to me. Too intimately connected with the characteristic shades of Napoleon's disposition, not to impose upon me the obligation of mentioning them.